Okay, we are live. It says, "Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Carvan. This is Ishan Sharma, and with me, I have two great men, gentlemen from Punjab and the U.S. Uh, Sir Preet Singh, author of the book that we are going to discuss this evening, the story of the six, and Dr. Gur Pradesh Singh. Uh, Sir Preet Singh, as we all know, uh, is a writer, podcaster, commentator who doesn't need any introduction. He is also the author of critically acclaimed "Night of the Restless Spirits" and the best-selling "The Camel Merchants of Philadelphia" and the writer-narrator of the story of the Six podcast that we see as a book now, and uh, which is there in the background. Um, so, um, Dr. Gurpreet Singh is a retired professor of English from Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar. He did his postgraduate study at EFLU, Hyderabad, and Leeds University, UK. He has published two books, another one in the press, and about forty articles and lectured extensively on language and literature. This evening, both these gentlemen will be in a conversation, and I will be uh, intervening uh, in and out uh, during the conversation, after the conversation. um uh, asking some questions to sir preet sir about the book but basically um just my role is going to be as moderator and nothing else so without any uh, further ado i request gur pradesh sir to formally uh, initiate the conversation and maybe the audience who are with us this evening can send their questions through the live chat live facebook chat we will be taking your questions in the end thank you so much over to you sir Oh, thank you very much, Ishan. And uh, good evening, everybody, or good morning. Our uh, speaker, our writer, is based in US, so good morning to him. Uh, yes, uh, Ishan has already introduced uh, Sabreet Singh. I don't have to do anything more except that uh, for a long, long time. uh he has been now in us but he spent the first 20 years of his life in india and that too uh, not very close to punjab he was brought up in in sikkim where he spent the first 20 years of his life and then uh, moved on to the us um he has been uh, publishing very regularly as uh, ishan has told you and uh, besides uh, the books that we are uh, that he has told he has also published in um, such uh, uh, eminent journals as the huffington post and the uh, boston herald uh the book that we are going to discuss today uh this is the book i should show you the uh closer picture now. okay this is the book that you can see it's quite a weighty book uh, both in size as well as in content <laughs> and uh, those of you who are uninitiated uh, in the study of sikhs uh, those who are not fam- much familiar with the history or story of the sikhs uh, i would say this is the book to go to uh, this is highly readable book and uh, this is a book uh, that tells the story of the the 10 masters the 10 gurus of the the sikhs uh, interestingly uh, the line stopped there after the 10th guru and the 10th guru said well now the book there is a very um, very uh, sacred book prepared by the 5th guru and uh, later on by the 10th guru and this book became the guru and sikhs those of you who are not much familiar probably uh, would like to know that we now uh, worship this book we now go by Uh, the word of this book rather than by any living uh, guru uh, the story that um, sarpreet has tried to tell you uh, is in a very interesting way uh, it's not the typical history book uh, it's it, it reads like a story and you can see when you read this uh, you will find there are uh, heroes there are villains there are uh, saints there are sinners there are the faithfuls and there are the the treacherous <laughs> the people also the warriors and the losers uh, it it creates a whole you know a uh, big drama uh, the way uh, the entire story of the sikhs kind of you know unfolded in those uh, two centuries um, 
he probably will tell you more about this, that the gurus led a very tumultuous uh, life and the story comes out with it uh, in, in, a, in a very vivid manner. Uh, an interesting feature of the book, before we get into the discussion of the book, is that uh, the book uh, presents uh, lots of materials, lot of sport from the, from the poetic works which were uh, produced in, in the honor of uh, gurus. Uh, they are in the form of a chronicler and uh, they, they tell the story of the gurus uh, in a very uh, poetic and in a very uh, literary manner. So the book is uh, not only a historical record of the gurus, but it is also uh, in a kind of a literary work. Uh, more of it, I think we will discuss as we go along discussing this book. Um, welcome, uh, uh, Sarpreji. And uh, we would like to start this, uh, this discussion with the very basic and the first question that is, uh, uh, what, what inspired you? What kind of made you write this book uh, when you already know that there are a few uh, important books on the history of the six? What particular you know, motivation you had and what particular uh, unique feature that you think you, you introduced in your book? Uh, sure, I'll be delighted to answer that question. Uh, first of all, let me start by thanking uh, Ishan for organizing this. Uh, Carvan, particularly during the pandemic, has emerged as a stellar online platform. I think this is my third appearance on the platform and each conversation has been wonderful with terrific moderators. Uh, this one is no exception. <clears throat> I'm grateful to Dr. Gurup Desh Singh for engaging with my book, reading it, and very kindly agreeing to be part of this conversation. So to get to your question, uh, the story of the six is, uh, I would call it an unabashedly personal take on the history of the Sikh faith. And I need to provide a little bit of color around that. As you had observed, I grew up in Sikkim, which is as far removed from Sikh culture and Punjabi culture as is possible in the Indian subcontinent. So, you know, we were literally one of the two Sikh families in Gangtok. There was a transient population of uh, army officers and civil servants, but there were only two families that lived there. So the community was pretty much non-existent. And while I was nominally a Sikh, uh, I was part of a very traditional Sikh family. My engagement with the faith of my forefathers was pretty much non-existent. Uh, as is usually the case, after I went to the US and I was far from my roots, at some point, you know, I was inspired, uh, you know, most people who leave their homelands are inspired to do, do this at some point in their lives. In my case, it was fairly early, it was as a young man. And through a curious set of circumstances, I was inspired to learn a little more about my faith, my background, and very specifically, my identity. Uh, which I will freely confess as a young man first growing up in Sikkim and then, you know, living in the U.S., um, I consider to be a bit of a burden, you know, because of the very sort of distinct physical appearance that practicing Sikhs have. It attracts a lot of attention and sometimes it's not very positive attention. So long story short, in those days, I did not read Gurmukhi. So I, uh, you know, the only recourse that I had was to read books in written in English. And the very first book that I encountered quite serendipitously on the shelves of my university library was uh, J.D. Cunningham's Story of History of the Six, which was written in uh, the 1800s when Cunningham served at the Ludhiana outpost of the British East India Company. Uh, where he had the opportunity to observe the Sikhs very closely as the Sikh empire was collapsing. So Cunningham wrote a very sympathetic account of the Sikhs. Uh, he admired the Sikhs tremendously. 
And in fact, in some quarters, it was said that he had the temerity to suggest that six might be the equals of Englishmen. I'm saying this tongue in cheek, it sounds funny now, but Cunningham had to suffer greatly for that. He lost his job and he died penniless for his efforts uh, to write a glowing history of the six. So that was the first book that I engaged with. Then I was fortunate to find uh, uh, The Sikh Religion by Max Arthur McAuliffe, which was written later, several decades after Cunningham's book. And it was also a very traditional account of uh, the Sikh gurus and their teachings. I did not know at that time what Cunningham's primary sources were, more about that, uh, sorry, what McAuliffe's primary sources were, but more about that later. I did learn that McAuliffe engaged heavily with Pai Khan Singh Nabba, who was one of the leading Sikh intellectuals of the time and uh, you know, one of the most important figures in the Singh Sabha reform movement in Sikhism. So McAuliffe, under the guidance of Pai Khan Singh Nabba, wrote, again, a very sympathetic history of the Sikhs and wrote about the teachings of the gurus which inspired me tremendously. You know, when I read Cunningham's book in particular, you know, I had a tenuous knowledge of Guru Nanak Sahib. I knew a little bit about Guru Gobind Singh. And in that sense, I was not very different from a lot of Indians or even a lot of Sikhs who know a bit about the first Guru and the 10th Guru and very little about the Gurus in the middle. Maybe Guru Arjan Sahib, you know, is a bit of an exception. So that was kind of, you know, my level of knowledge and understanding. When I read the histories of the history of the gurus, particularly in Cunningham's book, I was taken by how human the stories were. Dr. Gurubdesh uh, Singh alluded to this in his introduction of the book. But there was drama, there were sons fighting with their fathers, there were battles over succession, there was treachery, there was this constant facing off between the Sikh gurus and the Mughal emperors, starting from the reign of Babur, who was not even Mughal emperor then when he first met Guru Nanak, all the way to Aurangzeb and Bahadur Shah in the time of Guru Gobind Singh. This was high drama. The tragedy was almost Shakespearean. And, uh, you know, the stories were very, very inspiring. And, and then even though this is not relevant to the book that we're discussing today, after the period of the gurus, when I read about the trials and tribulations of the Sikhs, particularly in the 1700s, when they faced a tremendous amount of repression, first from the provincial governors of Lahore, who were under the control of the Mughal administration in Delhi, uh, then Amitra Abdali and his descendants, I learned about the holocausts, I learned about the battles, and I was introduced to essentially a time period which can perhaps be called the crucible in which the character of the Sikhs was forged all of these things inspired me tremendously. I was still a young man and, you know, um, I, I was not studying writing or the humanities. I was an engineering student and I got busy with my career and my family, but everything that I had read at that time stayed with me. Now, as the years passed, I developed a great passion for Sikh sacred music or Gurmit Sangeet, started learning it, started preserving it, started teaching it. And these sort of twin passions, <clears throat> my passion for Sikh history and my passion for Sikh sacred music, they combined to create this very personal retelling of the history of the Sikh gurus. Uh, I will mention though, before sort of concluding with this long winded answer to a simple question, the story of the Sikhs first saw light of day in the form of a podcast, which was started about three years ago. The name is the same. And, you know, I had started it on a whim, not really knowing whether anybody would be interested in listening to a podcast about Sikh history. 
but quite to my astonishment, it was wildly successful. Today, it's in its third season. I'm just starting to write the fourth season now. And it's been downloaded more than 150,000 times and has listeners in 95 plus countries. And it was really the response of my podcast audience that prompted me to write this book. Mm -hmm. So th there it is, not quite in a nutshell, but, you know, in a yeah. somewhat long winded manner, the story mm -hmm. of the creation of this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. But that's very important. Uh, how I think you found audience for your podcast, which means that lots and lots of people were interested in this kind of a story. Now, coming back to the, the story or the history of the Sikhs in that sense, uh, we would like to know from you, uh, what were the circumstances in the 15th century when Guru Nanak uh, appeared on the scene? Uh, you know, why is it that uh, uh, he was uh, able to establish this kind of a cult and uh, what were the uh, you know, practices which Hindus and Mus Islam or Muslims of that day were doing, which probably demanded some kind of a revision. Uh, can you just tell us something about the, the circumstances in which uh, the, the Sikh uh, religion kind of you know, came into being and at the same time, the intellectual as well as the spiritual development of Guru Nanak who was supposed to be the founder of this, uh, this religion. That, that's a big question. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll try my best to address it. Yeah, please. So in fairly simplistic terms, um, you know, at the time of Guru Nanak Sahib, when he was born in the 15th century, um, it would be an understatement to say that India, particularly Northern India, Guru Nanak's homeland, the Punjab, was in a state of ferment. And there were several reasons for that. Uh, there had been significant political instability. The ravages of Taimur were still relatively fresh in people's mind. The Lodi dynasty ruled in Delhi and exercised nominal control um, over Punjab, but it was a difficult time. You know, the Afghan rulers, uh, some of them had been benign, others had been bigoted. Um, so the ulama and uh, the Muslim intellectuals in certain cases tended to be quite repressive towards people of other faiths. So there was that on the one hand, as far as the political situation was concerned. Now, a majority of the people were Hindu and, you know, while... Uh, you know, a lot of historians believe that the origins of the caste system were benign. And like several other societies that organized themselves according to labor, uh, society had been organized such, you know, thousands of years ago. But in Guru Nanak's time, caste had calcified into an instrument of repression where the higher castes relentlessly oppressed the lower castes. There was no mobility. There was no social intercourse between castes. It was very, very rigid. And both Muslim society and Hindu society, Hindu society in particular, was replete with superstition and ritual. Uh, you know, the Brahmins on, uh, on the Hindu side and the Qazis on the Muslim side all exercise tremendous control over the common people. Life was difficult. And the young Nanak, being a keen observer from a very, very early age, took all of this in. Certain aspects of his personality started to emerge very, very early. Now, um, I believe the very first chapter of the book talks about the precocious young Nanak uh, when his formal education was about to begin, you know, as uh, a member, uh, you know, having been born into a high caste family, the day came when he was to be invested with the Janu and, you know, his formal education was about to begin. And the story, which is chronicled in some of the earlier accounts of Guru Nanak Sahib, known as the Janam Sakis, essentially goes 
that when the family priest, Pandit Hardial, was about to invest the young Nanak with the Janu, he stopped the priest and he started asking him questions, you know, which perhaps were rhetorical. You know, he said, is this thread going to make me a better person? Is it ever going to get dirty? Is it ever going to get burned? And, you know, the priest was indulgent and, you know, he figured this child is curious. So he tried to answer his questions to the best of his ability. And the young boy asked, can my sister get one? And of course the answer was no. And at that point, the lad spoke, and his words are enshrined in the sixth scripture of the Guru Granth Sahib, and they appear in translation in the book. And they articulate a very, very important part of Guru Nanak's philosophy, which was the rejection of inequality and the rejection of superstition. In fact, it might be interesting for the audience if I were to just read very quickly that relevant section yeah, about the, nice. the young Gurnanak. So the words Daya Kapa Santok Sut Jat Gandhi Satvat E Janeu Ji Ka Haita Pande Kat. Excuse me, can you get close to the microphone, please? Oh, I beg your pardon. The print was small, <laughs> so I had to get close to my lamp. <laughs> but oh, I, yeah. I'll read it now. I'll read the translation now. Yeah. Let mercy be your cotton, contentment be your thread. Knot it with your continence, with every twist let sooth be said. A sacred thread upon my soul, O Brahman, do bequeath, that will not ever be broken, that won't be touched with fire, that will not ever get dirty, that ever will not expire. O Nanak, to such a blessed thread, let every man aspire. Of course, there's no thread that will never get dirty or break or won't be burned by fire. So the young lad was making a point that he didn't believe that wearing a thread was going to do anything for him. And there it started. You know, everything that Gurnanak did, you know, the same chapter has a lengthy recounting of the story of the creation of the institution of the Langar, which is the community kitchen that the whole world knows about. If anyone knows anything about six, they know about the institution of the Langar or the community kitchen which is a great instrument of equality and social justice. How so? Equality, because in those days, caste distinctions were mostly implemented through commensality, which refers to the whole set of rules and regulations that govern the preparing and sharing of food. So if there was a wedding, everyone was invited, but the Brahmins sat in their own section and ate with other Brahmins and the Kshatriyas and so on. Nobody intermingled because you would lose caste. In Gurnanak's langar, everybody had to eat before they would be admitted to the Guru's presence with no regard to who was sitting to their left or their right, which meant that if you ate in the langar, you were ready to repudiate caste. The other aspect was that this was a community kitchen, which was intended to feed anyone who was hungry. And, you know, those of you who uh, live close to Gurdwaras know that if somebody is poor or hungry, they can go to a Gurdwara and eat in the langar three times a day, 365 days a year, no questions ever being asked. That was the genius of Guru Nanak. Now, it's important for me to emphasize that he was not the first religious thinker or leader in the Indian subcontinent who railed against superstition and inequality. There are several other Bhagats who came before him who had very similar thoughts. Bhagat Kabir is an example. Bhagat Namdev is an example. The key difference was that Guru Nanak was not just content to point out the you know, terrible things that existed in society and to oppose them, he actually wanted to do something about it. 
he created institutions that were designed to drive a stake through the hearts of these discriminatory practices and to debunk superstition. That was the bedrock of the Sikh faith, Guru Nanak's commitment to equality, his rejection of all forms of discrimination, his embrace of the entire world. And before I finish this answer, one more aspect of Guru Nanak's life and philosophy that I want to emphasize, which from his time to the present day is an integral part of the Sikh ethos. And that is an unequivocal commitment to fight tyranny. So when Guru Nanak was returning from his famous visit to Mecca, he stopped in a small town in what is now modern day Pakistan. It was called Sayyid, Sayyidpur, where one of his humble disciples, Pai Lalo, lived, a carpenter. Sayyidpur had just suffered a terrible attack by a warlord whose name was Babur, who was not yet the emperor. He was on his way to establishing the Mughal dynasty. This was about five years before the first battle of Panipat when Babur defeated the Lodis and established the Mughal dynasty. Guru Nanak saw what Babur had wrought. He saw the carnage, he saw the bodies piled up, he saw the wailing women, Hindu women, Muslim women, so-called high caste women, so-called low caste women, all of whom had, who had been molested, and his heart broke. And what emerged from his mouth was a powerful excoriation of Babur's tyranny which laid the foundation of an important part aspect of his faith, which was the confronting of tyranny, no matter what the personal cost. So these were roughly the conditions uh, when Guru Nanak came forth into the world. And these were some of the most fundamental ideas that were the bedrock of the faith that he went on to create ideas that continue to inform all aspects of the practice of the faith to this day. Thank you, yes, exactly. Uh, you have in fact uh, touched upon the most important uh, tenets of uh, Sikhism, where I think uh, equality and uh, the, the resistance to tyranny uh, are the hallmark. And I, I'm very glad that you mentioned about Langar also. This, this is one of the, uh, in a way, instruments or a device to, to bring people together. And uh, I think I'm very uh, grateful to my community. Probably it is the blessing of the, of the gurus that they have continued with this tradition for all these years, such a long time. And recently, I think the world has seen so much of it during any crisis you have seen people from UK, USA, in other countries, including India, and now they have expanded the idea of langa uh, into all other kinds of help. Uh, during pandemic, for example, in India, uh, we have seen uh, langars of medicines, langars of uh, uh, you know the the firewood and oxygen, uh, oxygen of course, oxygen of course. And I think uh, this is something that uh, the Sikhs have uh, imbibed and they have internalized into their into their psyche. Uh, good that you mentioned about it. Uh, Sabji Ji, I would like to ask you that besides these are the, you know, some of the practicing uh, principles of Sikhism, uh, you have told us the story of those 250 years when the 10 gurus uh, came on this earth. Uh, what are the events? I'm not talking about the events as they happen in the story. Uh, what are those events which you think are highly seminal? those events uh, which uh, have, have become almost the turning point uh, in the evolution of Sikhism. Uh, would you just uh, like to tell one or two of them, which you Absolutely. think Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I already touched upon some of them when we were talking about Guru Nanak Sahib and the conditions of his time. So let's move on uh, in chronological fashion from there on. One of the most significant events occurred 
after Guru Nanak Sahib completed his travels, which took decades and took him to far corners, and he established a community in Kartarpur where he started, you know, he worked as a farmer himself, setting an example for his followers. And a period of intense institution building started. The most significant thing that happened during that period was the transfer of the guruship from Guru Nanak Sahib to his humble disciple Pai Lerna, who was anointed as Guru Angad, the second guru of the six. Why was this important? As I said earlier, it could be argued that a lot of the ideas of Guru Nanak Sahib had been put forward by thinkers before him. It's an accurate statement. And Bhagat Kabir is a perfect example. Now, after Kabir passed, there was no Kabir too. There was only Kabir. But when time came for Guru Nanak to pass, he anointed a second Nanak. And that was fundamentally important because that was the moment when the guru ceased to be an individual and turned into an institution. Right, yes. And that was hugely important because it had a profound impact on the propagation of, and the growth of the faith moving forward. So this was a truly seminal event that occurred when the torch was passed from the first guru to the second. Since we have limited time, let me sort of jump forward and touch upon some of the most important things. Guru Arjun should be remembered for creating three great institutions, which again are fundamentally important to the Sikh faith to this day. The first was the building of the Sri Harmandar Sahib, the golden temple, which is in a certain sense, the very visible beating heart of Sikhism, even though the gurus attached no importance to pilgrimages or places of pilgrimage, there is no benefit that accrues to a Sikh by going to the Sri Harmandar Sahib. The gurus themselves didn't believe that, but it has become the heart of Sikhism. And when Guru Arjan Sahib created the Sri Harmandar Sahib, a temple dedicated not to a god or a goddess, but to the one divine, a temple which had four, do four doors, which indicated that people from all four directions were welcome. And even more importantly, people from all four castes were welcome. The fact that the Sri Harmandar Sahib was on ground that was lower than the surrounding ground, indicating humility. So this was a seminal event in the history of Sikhism when they acquired this very clear symbol of the faith, which sort of continued to, has continued to be, as I said earlier, the beating heart of this faith to this day. Huge moment. The second huge moment that occurred in the lifetime of Guru Arjun was the compilation of the Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh scripture. And there's a whole chapter dedicated to this in the book that talks about it in great detail. But let me touch upon the importance. You know, obviously it's important because it's the living spiritual guru of the Sikhs to this day. But, you know, we have to go back in time and look at the situation. There was rebellion within Sikhism. The guru's older brother, Prithi Chand, who was a very capable man himself and desired to be the Sikh guru, never acknowledged his younger brother's authority. He started creating his own hymns, which would be signed Nanak as well. Think about the confusion that it would cause the common Sikh. Today, with the benefit of hindsight, we know that there's, there was only one fifth guru, and that was Guru Arjun. But at that time, Prithi Chand was claiming that he was the guru as the oldest son of the previous guru. There were all kinds of uh, writings that were being passed off as the writings of the Sikh Gurus. And Guru Arjun decided that it was time to create 
an unimpeachable scripture that would contain the writings of the original Sikh gurus. And without getting into the weeds here, he did such a brilliant job of organizing the scripture with a sophisticated numbering system, which pretty much made it tamper proof. So it was a very brilliant way of creating an authentic structure, a scripture, which incorporated his own writings and the divine writings of his predecessors. And then in an act that was shocking in its Catholicism, he decided to incorporate the writings of Hindu saints and Muslim saints whose ideas were very similar to the ideas of the gurus. So what you ended up with was this very, very eclectic scripture that had the writings of the gurus and several other saints. And that became fundamentally important even in the time of Guru Arjun Sahib because he gave it pride of place. He bowed his head before it. And at the time of the 10th Guru, it was formerly anointed as the spiritual Guru of the six. So this was the second seminal moment in the time of Guru Arjun. The third institution is a little more abstract. You know, the first one is a Gurdwara that is, can be seen. The second is a scripture that is everywhere. The third institution was an idea. And this idea was that when tyranny reaches a certain point, no sacrifice is big enough. And since the gurus very much believed in walking the talk and practicing what they preached, in the face of, of the tyranny of Jahangir, the fourth Mughal emperor, Guru Arjun gave up his body. He became a martyr and he gave his life to oppose the tyranny of Jahangir. And that had profound, profound impacts on the trajectory and the history of the Sikh faith moving forward. So this institution of martyrdom, the willingness to lay down one's life, one's life for an ideal was hugely important. The next significant event I would point to, which immediately followed the uh, martyrdom of Guru Arjun was on his father's instructions, the donning of two swords by his young son, Guru Hargobind, the sixth Guru, who raised an army, fought battles against the Mughals, and thereby created this new method of direct action in the force of tyranny. The force of arms never for conquest, never for revenge, always for justice. Hugely important in the time of Guru Hargobind. And then I will point to a couple more things. We will now move forward to the time of Guru Teg Bahadur, the ninth Guru of the six, who always had a mystical and spiritual disposition. His name originally was Tyagmal you know, which means the one who is willing to give up everything. Now the young Tyagmal distinguished himself in battle in the time of his father, Guru Hargobind, and was given a new name, Teg Bahadur, the brave swordsman. He became the ninth Guru. And during his time on the throne, peacock throne in Delhi sat Aurangzeb, the grandson of Jahangir, in whose reign, tyranny once again accelerated. And we know the story, I won't reiterate it, a delegation of Kashmiri Brahmins uh, under the guidance of Pandit Kirparam uh, came to Anandpur Sahib to, uh, it wasn't called Anandpur at that time, uh, Makhowal uh, to meet with uh, Guru Teg Bahadur, asking them to intercede with the emperor who was insisting on forcible conversion. And Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, of course, knowing that Aurangzeb's mind was not going to be changed, went to Delhi, confronted him, and was beheaded for his troubles. Writing about his father's sacrifice, Guru Gobind Singh wrote, Tilaka Janjura, Ka Pravataka, Kino, Bado, Kalume Saka, 
that, you know, my father did this wondrous deed in this time of Kalyug to save the Tilak and the Janu. And isn't it ironic that this is the same Janu that Guru Nanak Sahib condemned, you know, a few hundred years ago. The point was not that there was anything bad about the Janu. The point was that superstition was not okay. But when time came to protect the Janu of the Hindus, Guru Tegh Bahadur was willing to give his head. Hugely important moment in Sikh history, and it really informed the course of the Sikh history over the next hundred plus years. It brought the Sikhs great sorrow, and it also brought them great glory. This willingness to embrace the pain of the other and to sacrifice oneself for somebody else's sake. And then finally, in the time of Guru Gobind Singh, there are a couple of things that happened that are hugely important. One of them, of course, the Basaki of 1699, when he created the Khalsa, and in a certain sense, put a seal on the new faith that Guru Nanak Sahib had started, echoing every ideal of Guru Nanak, Guru Gobind Singh formalized the faith of Guru Nanak into the Khalsa. And then I would say the final seminal moment came when the Guru was on his deathbed in Nander after a murderous attack by a couple of Pathans, when his followers exhibiting a lot of consternation at the Guru's impending leaving of the world asked him, who will guide us now? Now that you're going, you haven't anointed a successor. And the Guru did something unprecedented. He said, I am going to split my authority. I have two kinds of authority. I have spiritual authority and I have temporal authority. From here on, spiritual authority will rest in the Guru Granth Sahib. And Temporal authority, my dear followers, I return to you. Now, there was precedent for this because a few years earlier at Anandpur Sahib, when Guru Gobind Singh created the Khalsa and he initiated the first five Khalsas, he then bowed before them and said, now you have to initiate me. So in a certain sense, the 10th Guru had bowed before the common pant or the community once already. And on his deathbed, he bowed again and he said that my temporal authority, I give back to you, the community at large. I don't need to talk about the significance of the Guru Granth Sahib, right? It's quite obvious. The significance of the second part of turning over the authority was also tremendously important. It gave six the spirit that they exhibit today. If there is one thing that defines six, it is their Republican ideal. Every Sikh is a chief, every Sikh is a Sardar. And I say this, you know, tongue in cheek. You know, we experience this every day because we are a we are a community of chiefs and there are no followers. Everyone is a chief. Uh, but, you know, all facetiousness aside, this Republican ideal, which stemmed directly from the turning over of the temporal authority from the guru to his six, really strengthened the six and gave them courage. You know, in a similar session like this, which I was asked this question that, you know, six represent this ideal of a strong, energetic, empowered people who influence, whose influence seems to be disproportionate when you look at their numbers. Where does this spirit come from? This spirit comes from that seminal moment when Guru Gobind Singh said, I return the temporal power that you have given to me to you. So these are some of the key moments that really define, in my mind, the evolution of the Sikh faith in the times of the Gurus. Thank you. Let me tell you, uh, Sarbjiji, uh, nobody could uh, summarize 
or give in a synoptic form the, the entire history or the story of the Sikhs in, in as many words as you did. I think um, you have touched upon the most important features um, of, the, of the Sikh um, you know, history or Sikh evolution. Uh, thank you very much for this. I think my audience would be uh, very much benefited with this kind of uh, brief uh, uh, summary of the of the story that you have given us. But thank for you. the for, yeah, for the for the audience, you know, those uh, of you again who probably have uh, some idea about Sikhism, let me just uh, give you an aside, and that is that not many books on on Sikh history talk about the story of succession. I'll not ask uh, Sarbjit Singh to, to tell us about that, but those of you who are interested, it's a very interesting because there are intrigues. There are, there are family members who are turning hostile, who are, who are almost going to the extent of becoming treacherous. Uh, that story is a long one and it happens almost with the uh, first five or, or, or even six or seven, uh, seven I think uh, gurus. And uh, that story you should read on your own whenever you are interested. And that's a uh, very you know, interesting part of the, the story of the Sikhs. But we go on to the next uh, real you know, issue. And that issue is that, which I think uh, Sarabji Singh just now touched upon uh, when he talked about the sixth guru and how the, the resistance to tyranny turned into a kind of a militant action. Uh, by, by the Sikhs in those days against the Mughals. Uh, that story expands uh, quite a lot in the second half of the Guru's uh, you know, tale, the, the um, sixth Guru onwards, uh, this kind of hostilities between the Sikhs and the, and the Mughals continued for a long time. Now, uh, the important issue is that today, uh, some of the people, uh, some people who are not familiar with the, the Sikh uh, history, they, they consider uh, this as a rupture. They consider this as a, as a breach because with the first guru, uh, you can start with the saintly figure and it goes on till about fifth guru. Uh, they are all highly saintly, pious figures. But when the, with the advent of the sixth guru, the militancy starts. Uh, they consider this as a rupture. Uh, I would uh, request uh, Sarabji Singh to tell us that how this kind of uh, rupture has to be understood and how it is in fact a false uh, you know, breach. Uh, there is some kind of a continuity because I have already read a few other uh, scholars who continue to say that this thing is nothing new. It is a part of Guru Nanak's uh, uh, you know, hymns also. Darshan Singh Mani, for example, has written an article about that. I would like uh, you to tell us that how uh, this uh, rupture, seeming you know, kind of a rupture is not actually a breach of, of the faith. Uh, that, that's a terrific question. And uh, uh, you know, we have to first under understand this perception of a rupture before addressing it. The root cause, there is no one root cause for this uh, shall we say, imperfect understanding of Sikhism, it starts from popular art and makes its way to scholarship. Now, if we think about the most common image that comes to mind when we think about Guru Nanak, it's that of a gray beard with a very peaceful expression on his face, his hand raised in benediction perhaps, you know, in a calm, sort of relaxed kind of pose, meditating on the divine, maybe, you know, with a mala around his neck, that's our image of Guru Nanak Sahib. In contrast, when we look at, when we imagine Guru Gobind Singh, we imagine him as a young warrior, a hawk on one arm, a sword strapped on, a quiver of arrows poking out behind his head. This dichotomizing of the gurus, as I said, starts with popular art and continues all the way into scholarship, particularly less recent scholarship. It ignores several things. It ignores Guru Nanak's unequivocal commitment to fighting tyranny, 
which was not a whit less strong than that of Guru Gobind Singh's. The difference was that Guru Nanak picked up the pen and Guru Gobind Singh picked up the sword. It ignores, when we emphasize Guru Nanak's connection to the divine, at the expense of Guru Gobind Singh's connection to the divine, we ignore the fact that the writings of Guru Gobind Singh echo exactly the same philosophy and the same divine inspiration that we find in Guru Nanak Sahib's writings. Just a very simple example, Sikhs have a liturgy called the Nipname, which is a group of uh, writings that every Sikh is expected to recite every day. The first, in, uh, the first writing in this liturgy is the Japji Sahib of Guru Nanak. The second is the Jap of Guru Gobind Singh. If we look at the spiritual writings of Guru Gobind Singh, there is no difference between his philosophy and Guru Nanak's philosophy. And how could there be a difference? Because the traditional Sikh view, which has existed from the time of the Gurus, is that the same divine light animates all the Gurus, and the same light was passed from Guru to Guru and then on to the Guru Granth Sahib. Writers from Satta and Balwand, who were bards in the court of Guru Angad, and wrote an ode about the succession of Guru Angad, which is part of the Guru Granth Sahib, mentioned this, Kavi Senapati, who was one of the 52 celebrated court poets in Guru Gobind Singh's court, in his biography of Guru Gobind Singh, Sri Gursoba mentions this, that all the gurus were exactly the same. So any deep reading of Sikh philosophy will make it abundantly clear that there is no philosophical difference between Guru Gobind Singh and Guru Nanak. I will go so far as to say that the kirpan or the sword that Guru Gobind Singh bequeathed upon all of his followers when he created the Khalsa is nothing other than the physical manifestation of the cry of Guru Nanak when he saw what Babur had done to the residents of Sayyidpur. The underlying principle is exactly the same. There was no rupture. There is complete consistency between the philosophy of all the gurus. And oh, by the way, modern scholars see this. I will, you know, since uh, Karvan's talks often attract historians and students of history, I will mention two academics whose work is fairly recent who have done a lot of work in debunking this whole rupture theory. One of them is Dr. Ami P. Shah, who got her PhD at UC Santa Barbara, and her PhD dissertation was a translation of the Sri Gursoba, in which she lays to rest this rupture theory. I would also point to the writings of Dr. Karamjit Kaur Malhotra, who has done a lot of painstaking research to show that all of this uh, claim of a rupture is absolutely false and really stems from a poor understanding of the unity of thought that runs through the writings of all the gurus. From a practicing six point of view, there is no dichotomy there is no difference, and hence, there is no question of any kind of rupture. Ah, thank you, yes. I think we needed this kind of a, a clarification because many a times we have discovered that uh, one thing that some communities do not like about Sikhs are that they are you know, militant and they are aggressive. Well, anyway, we will not talk about the current uh, political situation, but I'll just like to take another important uh, point about uh, Sikh history, and that is about that, um, despite the fact that uh, Sikhism was a reaction against some kind of the orthodoxy that uh, Hinduism and Islam had at that time, uh, even today, lots of people consider Sikhism as part of uh, Hinduism. Uh, 
maybe because they think that uh, their scriptures have a lot of uh, Hindu references or because uh, most of the people who converted into Sikhism were Hindus uh, to begin with. Uh, they, they may have other reasons to say this. Uh, but the point is that lots of Sikhs, they consider this as uh, a separate uh, religion. And one of the stories that I would like to tell is that in 1974, uh, Sadar Kapoor Singh, again, one of the scholars, six scholars, he happened to be in Toronto. And in those days, they were going to have some kind of a word conference on, on religions. And when he contacted the organizers, he discovered that there was none from the Sikh, Sikh faith. And he contacted them, told them that, no, I think you need one from this. And they were able to, you know, uh, see the point and they invited him and he gave a long lecture on, on that occasion and uh, he was able to say that how it is different from other uh, religions. I would like to just ask you at this point, uh, not whether Sikhism is separate or not, but I would like to know that uh, what could be the political reasons for saying this and second, if there are any fundamental uh, religious or, or spiritual reasons to, to call themselves a separate, a separate religion, then I would like you to tell us those things. A great, great question. And, uh, you know, I, my answer comes from a place of deep respect for Hinduism and a deep respect for Islam. Why? Because that's what Guru Nanak Sahib embodied. Guru Nanak Sahib didn't go around telling Hindus, stop being Hindus and become my followers. He didn't tell Muslims to stop being Muslims and become Sikhs. He told Hindus to be good Hindus and he told Muslims to be good Muslims. So while the Sikh faith is marked by deep respect for other faiths, no guru said, follow me or you're going to burn in hell. No, you know, I'm, 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 being, I'm, you know, exaggerating, but you know what I mean. Uh, you know, the gurus didn't put forth Sikhism as having any sort of exclusivity when it came to a path to the divine. They recognized multiple streams, multiple traditions. That is my own personal worldview. And, you know, I'm speaking absolutely for myself as a Sikh. I find it somewhat offensive when somebody tells me what my faith is. You know, I don't presume to tell a Hindu what Hinduism is. I don't presume to tell a Christian what Christianity is. And I would like to be extended the same courtesy. And, you know, I'm being half tongue in cheek, but you know exactly what I mean. You know, I was in Calcutta a few years ago at the Birla Academy of Art and Culture speaking about one of my previous books, uh, uh, Camel Merchant of Philadelphia, when a gentleman got up in the audience, he said, oh, your book sounds wonderful. And then he went completely off topic. And, you know, I'm paraphrasing loosely here. And the burden of his song, so to speak, was, ye Sikh dharam, dharam nahi hai, ye panth hai. You know, jaise... Bodhi Panth hai, Jain Panth hai, Sikh Panth hai, Dharam nahi hai. So his point was that Sikhism is just one more stream in the vast river of Hinduism. And you know what? Somebody could be approaching this from a couple of different angles. Somebody could be approaching this in a very benign way, where one's thought process might be, that the river of Hinduism has informed thought in the Indian subcontinent for millennia. And all of these faiths sort of emerge from that river. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that's a very, very valid thing to say. And if we are saying this to emphasize our oneness and unity, and the fact that there are several ideals that are common to many faiths, I salute that. I absolutely salute that. But when it comes from a place 
where somebody would deny me my identity saying that your faith doesn't even exist independently. I have huge issues with that. And, you know, you can create a fabulous intellectual argument to, to, to completely demolish this idea that Sikhism is not an independent faith. But I suspect that those who say this with an agenda are not likely to be convinced by whatever one might say. Suffice it to say, clearly, unequivocally, Guru Nanak was divinely inspired. We have primary sources. Guru Nanak himself says, Jaisi me ave khasam ki bani taisada kari gyan ve lalo. So when addressing his disciple Lalo, he says, you know what, Lalo? As this bani, his writings, comes to me from my master who is God, thus do I articulate it. So Guru Nanak Sahib himself tells us that he is divinely inspired. And then he goes on to create institution after institution that separates his faith from Islam, separates his faith from Hinduism. It doesn't negate the fact that there are things in Sikhism that you find common you know, in Hinduism that you find in Islam as well. One would argue that these wonderful truths you find in most faiths, that doesn't make all faiths the same. So to kind of summarize all of this, I would say that any serious scholar would absolutely debunk the notion that Sikhism is not an independent religion. It is, it is recognized as such. And to go back to your specific question, Guru Desh Singh Ji, I am not cynical. I actually believe that a lot of people who would embrace Sikhism as part of the broader tolerant umbrella of Hinduism come from a place of inclusiveness. And then, of course, there is that section which would deny not just six their identity, but views Christians with suspicions, views Muslims with great suspicion and hatred, all of which ideas are repugnant to a practicing Sikh. And for anybody who approaches this, you're not a unique religion from this particular angle. I have no time for them. And I wouldn't even waste time trying to educate them because they have an agenda and they will not be educated. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you have raised it, you know, very quietly in a very, uh, say, stealthily. You have raised a lot of political questions, but I'm not going to uh, <laughs> just. I'm not going to talk about them right now. I would ask Ishan, uh, do we have time for one more question? I think that's very important, but. Uh, if there are audience questions, then we would like to take them first. Ishan? Uh, no, so we, we can continue with the one last question and then I'll ask the audience questions. Okay. Uh, the last question is uh, something, you know, uh, which I guess uh, uh, your reviewers have raised and um, which probably the historians also would like to raise. And that question is that despite the fact that you say this book is a kind of a personal take on the story of the six. Uh, they say you cannot escape <laughs> from the, the question of authenticity. Uh, the book largely depends upon uh, literary sources. The book largely depends upon uh, the, the panegyrics or the, or the eulogies, uh, which uh, most of the uh, followers wrote um, you know, in, in appreciation of the gurus. Uh, we sometimes find that the stories that emerge from these uh, sources, they turn out to be marvelous, they turn out to be magical, apocryphal in, in, in many ways. Uh, those stories, therefore, are less trustworthy. Uh, how would you kind of you know, make your story more trustworthy? And in what way you think uh, the story of the six uh, can be, uh, say, uh, turned into a historical uh, tract also. So um, 
let me allow me to be a little tongue in cheek for a second. Yeah. Uh, you know, fortunately, I am not a historian by training, and you know, I don't have a title affixed to my name. I make no bones about the fact that this is an unabashedly personal take on the faith. This is very much a six viewpoint. Um, I'll offer a funny story for just a second. You know, one of my protégés who is extremely, extremely bright, you know, very young fellow, when he first listened to my podcast said, Uncle G, I really loved your podcast, but you almost seem to have turned Guru Nanak into a secular humanist. And, you know, that made me chuckle because yes, it's absolutely true. The book emphasizes those aspects of the Sikh faith that I personally found uplifting. But to not avoid your question and answer it in a very, very direct manner, McAuliffe's work on the Sikh religion, the title of the Sikh religion is accepted as one of the seminal writings on Sikhism in the English language. Several years after reading McAuliffe's work, uh, when I started you know, reading Gurmukhi myself, I engaged with the writings of Pai Veer Singh, and I engaged with uh, uh, Kavi Santok Singh, the writer of the uh, Guru Pratap Suraj Granth, whose Braj poetry appears often in this book. I discovered that McAuliffe tends to faithfully follow the writings of Kavi Santok Singh and the Guru Pratap Suraj Granth for the most part. Uh, I have actually tried to be quite meticulous in my research. My sources are mentioned, you know, even though I might not have created a formal bibliography in the group, my sources are mentioned very clearly. I refer to historians such as Dr. Gandha Singh, uh, Dr. Trilochan Singh, you know, Dr. D.P. Ashta when I write about Dasam Granth and so on and so forth. I go to the work of a lot of modern historians, which is cited. So even though I did not set out to write a work of history, I have tried to be very meticulous as far as my sources are concerned. And the literary aspect of the book, I think mostly lends color. You know, let's go to the visit of the Emperor Akbar to Goindwal, you know, when he visited Guru Amar Das. So his, a historian, if I had written this as a historian, I would have said, Akbar went to Goindwal, he met with uh, Guru Amar Das, they had a wonderful discussion, the, possibly he ate in the langar, and then he gave Guru Amar Das a land grant, even though Guru Amar Das said he had no need of anything. You know, that's how a historian would write it. I went to the account of Santok Singh, where he talks about the approach of the Mughal army, their banners flying, light flashing off of the point of their spears, the emperor's elephant bows low, the emperor gets off, his attendants spread silken carpets in front of them, the emperor pushes them aside, takes off his shoes, walks barefoot to see the guru, and then he is offered porridge without salt because that's what everybody in the langar is eating. And the emperor says that I've never tasted anything so fine in my life before. The rhetoric, the color, all of that is absolutely fabulous. And I say that we are enriched by it. And that's the kind of book that I set out to write. I want to inspire the imaginations of young people. I want them to engage with the literature that I have cited. And that's what I set out to do in my book. That's but exactly I, would stand, I would stand by my sources. I just wanted to add that. No, I think your resources are perfectly uh, <laughs> legitimate because not you, many other historians have also used them. But uh, what I wanted to say was that uh, that's exactly what I uh, found interesting about your book, that you have been able to cull sources and the references uh, which make the reading interesting. Uh, it's not a plain telling of the history of, uh, of a faith or of a, of a particular religion. Uh, it's, a, it's a story of the people. It's the story of the events 
that they went through. And I think the literary uh, flourishes that you have added to them, uh, in fact, are, are, the, are the really you know, highlights of this uh, story. Uh, I enjoyed them very much myself. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, I guess. I think we can go on. There are a number of other uh, questions which I can ask, but I would ask now Ishan if there are uh, some audience uh, you know, queries uh, so that Subjit, you can answer them. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Singh, for such an amazing uh, conversation. I think truly, uh, you know, we are honored to host you. And it was, I, I was listening to it. I was writing down, uh, you know, on my notepad, all the points that uh, Sir Preet Sir also mentioned. Some interesting facts that we couldn't, you know, uh, uh, take out from him, especially the political one, but those were very interesting. And, you know, the, the masala thing in this conversation somewhere. So thank you so much for this conversation. We have a lot of questions from the audience and I'll, I'll select four or five uh, seeing the time. Uh, this is by Nubia Serrano. Her question is, how do you think scholars nowadays could contribute to six studies from the perspective of literature? Uh, so I would say that uh, we really need people to go back to a lot of the texts that are cited in this book. I will give you some examples. Uh, there is the Sri Gur Soba of Senapati, which is um, the, the first biography of Guru Gobind Singh that was written in his lifetime. Now, the Sri Gur Soba has been translated into English by two scholars, by Dr. Ami P. Shah, as part of her dissertation, and also by Dr. Kulvant Singh. Both of these are wonderful translations, but it would be wonderful to see more work of a similar nature. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if uh, uh, the Gurpratab Suraj Granth has been translated. Uh, I'm pretty sure it hasn't been translated into English. Uh, it's a 14 volume tome, you know, you could probably see it in the background on my bookshelf. It's, it's the blue books in the background. I would love to see somebody translate some selections from the Gurpratab Suraj Granth. Uh, similarly, uh, there are a couple of other sources that are uh, cited in the book. Uh, one of them is the Gurbilas Patshahi Chemi, which is also, so the Gurpratab Suraj Granth is in Braj Bhasha, as is Sri Gursoba. Also, the Gurbilas Patshahi Chemi, which is an account primarily of the sixth guru that I use liberally in some of the middle chapters of the book. To my knowledge, it has never been translated into English. And I'll tell you that translating some of these old texts from Braj is a joy and a challenge. I think this is a great area for scholarship. I would love to see Gurbilas Patshahi Chemi translated. I would love to see Gurbilas Patshahi Dasvi translated. And there are any number of texts which are lost to modern readers. Uh, there are sections of the Dasam Granth itself, you know, that could benefit from translation. Uh, the translation of the Guru Granth Sahib itself is a huge, huge area for, you know, scholars of literature. Uh, you know, let me just say this, translating poetry from one language to another is an impossibly difficult thing to do. And when you add the spiritual element to it, it becomes an order of magnitude more difficult. While we have literal translations of the Guru Granth Sahib, which are very useful, don't get me wrong, they are very beneficial to somebody who does not read Gurmukhi, for instance. But you know, when you translate to the letter from one language to another, what you're left with is something that is prosaic and soulless. So that's a huge area, a translation of the Guru Granth Sahib that tries to convey some element of the bhav, the emotion, the intent of the author. These are all topics which could generate many, many, many PhDs, in my opinion. And, you know, they would, they, uh, you know, this, this work would well serve the world at large, not just six. Yeah. 
thank you so much for giving me an idea for my phd in the future <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, the next question is by jyoti maya khatri uh, her question is his question is, i'm sorry uh, guru tegh bahadur gave up his life for the protection of tilak and jane you did the sacrifice attract the kashmiri pandits to the sikh faith uh so <clears throat> i never try to answer questions that i don't have an answer for so whether any kashmiri pandits actually converted to sikhism or not i honestly don't know uh, i would say though that it didn't matter whether they did or not because certainly when guru tegh bahadur sahib did what he did he wasn't looking for converts i mean i'm i'm being a little facetious here we all know that to be true uh but i have to say that it certainly got uh, the sikh faith a tremendous amount of respect and you know we have to look at the sacrifice of guru tegh bahadur sahib not in isolation the sacrifice of guru arjan and the sacrifice of guru tegh bahadur was not an isolated act you could see that playing out again and again in the 18th century if you'll humor me for a small digression by the way this part of the history is is coming in the story of the six volume 2 uh, which i'm in the process of writing right now so after nadir shah's invasion of the mughal empire in 1739 the mughal empire began to decline precipitously so the back of the mughal empire was broken by nadir shah shortly after when nadir shah himself was assassinated one of his lieutenants <coughs> ahmed shah durrani seized power and set up as the king of afghanistan and then he proceeded to invade india eight times or nine times depending on what account you read completely accelerated the process of the decline of the mughal empire that had been started by nadir shah punjab was thrust into a tremendous amount of turmoil ahmed shah the son of mohammad shah ragile ceded the province of punjab formally to ahmed shah durrani of afghanistan so now ahmed shah durrani had nominal control of punjab subsequent mughal wazirs in particular imadul mulk among others periodically tried to reassert mughal authority again in punjab often times with the help of the marathas who later on became sort of the the power that propped up the mughal throne the result was that the sikh homeland was buffeted on both sides by the afghans on the one side the mughals slash the marathas on the other the provincial governors at lahore in lahore were weak sometimes they paid allegiance to amacha sometimes they paid allegiance to the court of delhi the net result was that there was massive violence plundering terrible things the only power that stood for the people at that time were the six we hear multiple stories of six harrying the afghans when they were retreating back to kandahar from india laden with booty and captives attacking them freeing their captives taking them home often at great cost ahmed shah abdali decided to teach the six a lesson in 1762 he perpetrated what we six called the vadaka lukara or the great holocaust during one massacre by various accounts 40% 40% of the sikh population was decimated in one fell swoop the sri harmandar sahib was blown up detonated desecrated multiple times so many six lost their lives all of this is nothing but an extension of the sacrifice of guru tegh bahadur so whether it got him followers i don't know but it certainly got the sikhs a tremendous amount of respect and it informed their own character in very very profound ways yes uh 
there's a question by swaran jeet singh his question is were the sikh gurus divine or humans interesting question semantics are tremendously important the gurus themselves emphasized that they were human guru gobind singh famously said that he who calls me god will be cast into the depths of hell so the fact of the matter is that the gurus themselves said that they were human were they divinely inspired yes moko das tavan ka jano ta me bhed na ranch pachano this is what guru gobind singh ji says after saying jo humko parmeshwar uchre hain he is going to go to the depths of hell and then he says don't look at me as a slave or a servant of the divine and recognize that there is no difference between me and him when he says difference he means separation so the gurus in my view were unequivocally human but they were equally unequivocally divinely inspired and in the sense that any true devotee becomes one with god they were one with god guru tegh bahadur in his writing says nanak leen bhayo gobind syo jo pani sang pani so i have become as close to god as water is with god but did he say i am god no absolutely not very interesting answer to the question i uh this is by gurinder singh jhulka his question is he he requests you to throw some light on the panch kakar and their significance and reason for their introduction in the religion and faith okay so um uh, for the benefit of the audience who may not understand the question fully the five kakar are the five articles of faith that guru gobind singh bequeathed upon his followers on that memorable day on the vasakhi day of 1699 when he created the khalsa so the five kakars are integral to the practice of initiated sikhs who are known as the khalsa it is above my pay grade i'm being facetious again to speculate why the gurus promulgate why guru gobind singh gave those five specific things to his followers you can read all kinds of rational explanations as to why the sikhs wear their hair long why they carry a kirpan and a tanga and a kada and a kachhara and so on i don't think that's a very interesting argument for a practicing sikh to get into from my perspective these were the gifts of guru gobind singh to his followers this was the uniform of the khalsa this was an integral part of sikh identity the modern sikh rahat maryada or the code of conduct which can be traced directly back to the sayings of the gurus and the writings of among others pai nandalal who was one of the other celebrated court poets of guru gobind singh and wrote the rahatnama and the tadkhanama which defines the sikh code of conduct and the way of life all of these things tell us that when guru gobind singh created the khalsa this was an integral part of the identity that he created for his followers so it is integral to the practice of the sikh faith from the time of guru gobind singh onwards as a practicing sikh i simply don't feel comfortable seeking rationalizations for their existence and i just don't get into that conversation definitely uh, there's a question by g krishnan uh, the question is how do you see the relation between sikhism and sufism uh so i actually did see krishnan ji's question a little earlier i am actually not able to read it now for some reason it seems to be hiding some of the comments uh so there are a lot of parallels that can be drawn 
between the writings of some of the gurus and the writings of the Hindu Bhagats, for instance. And by the way, many Hindu Bhagats, their writings appears in the their writings appear in the Guru Granth Sahib. Case in point, Bhagat Kabir, Bhagat Namdev, Bhagat Ravidas, uh, many, many, many others. Similarly, the writings of Sheikh Farid, who was a Sufi, also appear in the Guru Granth Sahib. So there is a lot of commonality of thought that you can find. Uh, Sikhs are respectful of Sufis as they are respectful of you know, Hindus and Muslims and Christians because that's what our gurus taught us to be. Let me answer the question in a very, very personal kind of manner. I find uh, Sufi poetry very, very inspiring. I am absolutely fascinated by the close relationship between Guru Arjan Sahib and Sai Mia Mir, who was a Sufi of the Qadri order and who Guru Arjan Sahib met when he was in Lahore. The book talks about that story. When I was in Lahore in early 2020, um, I made a very memorable visit to Nankana Sahib to visit the site where Guru Nanak Sahib was born. Also very memorable for me was my visit to the Darga of Saimi Amir. I also made it a point to visit the Darga of Madhulal Hussain or Shah Hussain and the Darga of Baba Bulle Shah in Kasur. So I personally resonate tremendously with Sufi thought and I have a particular love for the writings, of course, of Sheikh Farid, and then the writings of Baba Bulle Shah, and most importantly, the writings of Shah Hussein. And if I can leak something, one of my forthcoming books is about Shah Hussein and is very tightly centered around his poetry. You're doing a great service, my dear, because not many have done uh, much work on um... Shah Hussain, and he is a very prominent uh, Punjabi uh, Sufi poet. People talk and touches about, the heart. His poetry yes, touches your heart. Yes, people talk about Bulle Shah. They don't uh, write much about him. And if you are going to do some translation, that would be a wonderful thing. So I actually have translated quite a few copies of uh, Hazrat Shah Hussain's, and the copies that I have translated have been completely woven into the fabric of the novel that I've actually completed about Shah Hussain. Hopefully, it'll see the light of day soon. So good, thank you. Maybe, maybe you can recite some of the poetry in the end of the session. Uh, sure. Yourself. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Uh, the next question. Ishan, sorry, Ishan, let me also tell you that uh, uh, the book that you have uh, in your hand, The Story of the Six, is full of a uh, lot of poetry that uh, reflects the, the story of the six. And he has translated them with a lot of inspiration and love. Uh, the kind of, you know, uh, the, the, the tonal quality or the, or the spiritual thing. Uh, which we find in the native languages, he has tried to retain that. His translations are extremely inspiring. Uh, if you are interested, read them and you will discover what I mean. Definitely, definitely. Uh, we'll take two last questions because it's already uh, 8.30 in India, so we won't uh, take too long. This is by... Mm, okay. Let's take this question. This is by uh, Gurdas Dhawal, Dadwal, sorry. His question is, can six studies be divided into two categories, scholars based in India and those based outside? If so, how can we bring the two together? So uh, this is not a question that goes to my core competency, to be very honest with you. Uh, I am completely non-discerning uh, as far as the origins of scholars are concerned when I do my reading. You know, I refer to a lot of Indian scholars and I also refer to a lot of Western scholars. Uh, let me sort of answer the question the best that I can. It's important to understand that uh, you know, when history is studied in the West, uh, there are certain demands that are placed upon scholars. And I'm on 
an extremely slippery slope here because I'm not a historian. I don't have a PhD. This is what you know, this is a layman's observation. So your mileage from, from this might vary. But what I see is that scholars in the West in particular are expected to question everything, quote unquote. And if your tone is not questioning or not questioning enough, then maybe your work is considered to be suspect. And as a result of that, you know, when I look at the quote unquote, some of the Western scholars of Sikhism, I see this strong undercurrent of skepticism, which from my perspective goes a step beyond scholarship. And it almost seems to be skepticism for the sake of skepticism. Uh, you know, I, I freely acknowledge that this is not my area of expertise, and I might be offending scholars by saying this. I will say this, though, that I do see that trend changing. And Ami P. Shah is a perfect example of such a scholar uh, whose work completely stands up to intellectual scrutiny. And she doesn't feel inclined at all to throw quote unquote tradition into the trash can, which I see some Western scholars may be guilty of doing. I don't know. Again, not my area of expertise. Yes, even you are a great example when it comes to, you know, such a beautiful writing because uh, I have read this, I've loved it. And many of my friends who are not history students have never studied history after class 10. They've loved, they, lo they have loved this book thoroughly and they have given me great reviews and I'll share it with you offline after this, after this session. And uh, this book is available. Uh, let me just show it again. This book, the story of the Sikhs is available on Amazon in India. And I think in almost all the bookstores uh, where I live and in Delhi. So you all can get this book there. Uh, and hopefully whenever Sarapisar is in India, get that signed wherever he is in some literary festival or in Delhi. Uh, so we look forward to that. Thank you so much, Guru Pradesh, sir, for taking out so much time from your schedule to do this conversation. It's a truly an enlightening session with you being there as the moderator. Thank you very much. I think, Ishan, the pleasure is all mine. But I think the, the, the real... Uh, Say luminary of the evening was uh, <laughs> Sarpreet himself. Yes, very um, kind. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And thank you so much, everyone. Uh, there's there's a question from somebody, so uh, that's for us. Can this session be assessed later? Yes, this session will be available on our YouTube channel that you have to subscribe after this video. Go and subscribe to the channel for all the latest lectures that we do. There are many more sessions coming up, more with Sarapisa with his next book that he has just told us. So we are <laughs> eagerly waiting for that now. And there are many more sessions that are there for you all. So this will be available forever on the YouTube channel and also on the Facebook page if you can find that video. Uh, so th th that is how you can assess them later because he wants to show it to your family. Yes, please do share it with your family members, with your friends, peers, everyone, because I think it should be, uh, it should be spread more uh, to a wider audience. And the book is available. Get the book, gift this book to your friends, because I think books are the best gift that you can give to anybody. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, Sarapisa, for giving us this opportunity to host this session. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you very yeah. much. And thank you, Dr. Gurudev Singh Ji. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. It was a pleasure.